Right. Now we're going to get started. All right, so we're going to go over Chapter 7, the uh, promulgated agenda in other forms. So this is basically going to be everything else that's promulgated by Shrek um, that are not these six contracts we talked about. So the learning objectives are going to be describe the proper use of the addendum for sale of other property by the buyer. We're going to describe the proper use of the addendum for a backup contract, proper use for the addendum of reservation of oil, gas, and other minerals. Identify which form a buyer should use to reserve the right to terminate a contract and describe how mutual termination of a contract should be handled. Describe the proper use of the addendum for property located seaward of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway and the addendum for coastal area property. Describe the proper use of the addendum for property subject to mandatory membership and owners association. Describe the proper use of the short sale addendum. The proper use of the non-contract form such as the resale certificates, the consumer information form or the information about brokerage services form, and also describe the proper use of the remaining optional use form, such as the non real estate items addendum, Texas real estate consumer notices concerning hazards and deficiencies. There is a lot of stuff and a lot of forms we're going to go over. So, what I was saying earlier that y'all couldn't hear me was none of these will count on a contract unless you check the boxes in uh, paragraph 22 on the contract saying that these forms will be added to the contract. If you do not check that box in 22, they don't count. So while there is a lot of these, if you don't check that box, they're not going to count towards um, a court will not see them when it comes to the contract. All right, so the first thing we're going to do actually is the addendum for sale of other property by the buyer. So this provides a contingency for the buyer in case the buyer cannot sell other property. Uh, time is of the essence. This is one of the promulgated forms that time is of the essence for. Um, or that they, they will use that term in, and that is required for this. And the seller may continue to show the property, and if seller accepts the offer, can require a buyer to waive contingency. So what I'm going to do actually is just pull up the form so we can look at it a little bit easier on there. Um, and like I was saying earlier, if you just go to the um, Trek website, go to contracts, other addendas, uh, you can scroll down and all the addendums are going to be right here. So we're going to sale of other property by the buyer. All right, so here in this case, let's say we're selling That's All right, let's just throw that out there. This is the property we're using for this. So, um, like I said, what this form is basically going to do is that if you are trying to purchase a property, but you have a property you are selling at the same time, you basically can add a contingency in it that you cannot purchase the property unless your current property is sold. Um, this saves a lot of people from being in a situation where if their house is worth $300,000 and they're buying a $300,000 house, they might need that money in order to pay for the house. They can't own two houses. They don't have enough finances to own two houses. So you can add this to basically give you that second, um, or give you a contingency where you're not going to be locked into that contract of purchasing unless your other house sells. So this is the uh, to paragraph A, the contract is contingent on the buyer's receipt of the proceeds from the sale of the buyer's property at, and this would be, um, let's just, just say that. Okay, so you're selling your house at 456 Oak Boulevard. You're basically saying that this contract that I'm signing for 123 Main Street is contingent on my sale of my current house at 456 book. Um, and you would put in here uh, on or before, and then basically um, your closing date. So your closing date for your current property that you own. So if we were closing, let's say, I'll just put um, June 15th, 2021. So this is June 15th would, would be the closing date for my, the closing and funding date for Four, five, six, oak, which is my current property. Now, what this is going to do is, again, this covers you in the fact that basically until June fifteenth, um, if the contingency is not satisfied or waived by the buyer by the above date, the contract will just terminate and the earnest money gets given back uh, refunded to the buyer. So, if I sign for a, um, if I sign up for a closing date with the house I want to buy, and that closing date we make it June eighteenth. This is saying that if I don't get my funds by June fifteenth, the prop like the contract I'm in to buy the next one just to terminate it. 
I basically can back out of that contract because I did not receive the funds for my current property. Uh, if the seller um, accepts a written offer to sell the property, the seller shall notify the buyer of such acceptance and the seller requires buyer waive the contingency. Now what that is stating is that you actually as a seller, so if I am purchasing this house from McKenna, she's the one that lives at 123 Main Street and is selling her home. I can put in that contingency that unless I get, when I get funding on June 15th that I'm in contract to buy the property, if she receives a better offer that does not have a contingency clause, she can accept that offer and basically reject mine. So not reject, that's what, I wouldn't use those words exactly, but basically what happens is that if I have a contingency and then McKenna accepts a property or a contract that does not have a contingency, she can basically require that I waive my contingency and then we are locked into a contract or she will accept the other one. Um, what this does is it still gives the person, like in me in this instance, it still gives me first right where if McKenna wanted to, uh, she liked the other offer because it didn't have a contingency, she has to let me know and I can waive my contingency and then still be under contract with her. But if I refuse to waive my contingency, that's when it's terminated and she moves on to her other contract. So this kind of gets a, it's a win for the seller in this situation because they get to move on if that happens, but uh, they are risking that if they don't get another offer, they basically have a contract that can just be terminated because they have people who didn't sell their home. So if they've already accepted the one with the contingency and then they receive another offer that doesn't have a contingency, they have to stay in contract with the one with the contingency? They yes. Break that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what basically what happened is McKenna would let me know, hey, I received another offer. Um, if the house is 300000 I received another offer at $300,000 that doesn't have a contingency. I'm going to accept that one. And right here, you know, you have three days after the seller notices the buyer. So basically she's giving me three days to waive my contingency. And if I don't, the contract's dead and she moves on to the, the new offer. She's like the other, the other offer. Um, if I waive my contingency, however, we are still under contract. I just don't have a contingency clause anymore. Um, now, one thing we always say is that, uh, I know Justin really harps on don't, if you have a contingency clause, keep it. Don't ever waive it because you really don't want to be in a situation where this happens, you get three days, so you waive your contingency. Well, then this transaction doesn't go through. And now you're now you're stuck buying two houses or you're stuck buying a house while you have a house because you got rid of your contingency clause. So it's better to just let it go. Your client's going to be upset about it. Again, you can't force them to do anything, but advise them that it's best to let it go. They're going to be upset, but I'd rather them be upset and we find another house in a few weeks than, than be in a situation where they now are stuck, you know, with, with two homes that they can't afford. So, um, and as far as on paragraph five of the contract where it has the additional earnest money of a certain amount, this would be kind of a situation where that could come in where basically if um, it's usually something, I want to say like, let's just say 500. So basically, in this situation, McKenna is requiring that I waive my contingency, and by doing so, I waive my contingency, and I will put up another five hundred dollars in earnest money to kind of prove that I waive the contingency, and I'm serious. Of, like not all that sort of stuff, to prove that you're serious of tending it. Um, again, this is a weird one that you'll do. That you'll see this a lot, but like for me, it's mainly just paragraph A because if it comes down to it, we have to waive it. I just We'll tell them I wouldn't. So, um, but for the most part, you, you this one you'll see not a lot, but you'll see it every once in a while. It's a little more common than uh, some of the other ones we're going to go through today. So, uh, just something to keep in mind. All right, and then the next thing we're going to talk about is. Yeah, we're going to talk about the backup contract. So basically, this makes it contingent upon termination of the first contract. Time is of the essence for this one as well. This is another one. So, sale of other property and backup contract are both going to be. Uh, they're both going to have time is of the essence in them. So neither party required to perform during contingency period, although earnest money and any option fee must be paid as provided in the contract. So, I'll 
I'll pull this one up as well. We can go through this. It's a little bit easier when the, con when the actual contract is up. Okay, so again, why not? So, um, what this situation would be is if I find, let's just keep looking, it makes it easier. So, McKenna still owns one two Main Street. I find a property. Uh, I really, really like the property. So, I want to put in an offer. So, I have my agent call McKenna. McKenna goes, Well, we actually already received an offer. We're already under contract. Well, if I refuse to move on, and if this is the home I really want, I can submit a backup offer, which basically will put me in a contract with them that will become effective when McKenna's deal with the current contract falls through. So this is a weird thing that I, I haven't done one of these and they're fairly rare. Um, but basically what will happen is, let's see, the first contract, let's say she went under contract, uh, let's say today, why not? This is big. So I just found this house. We went and looked at it yesterday. We really liked it. And then today I wanted to put in an offer and she said, well, sorry, we already accepted one this morning. Then in this situation, um, I would put in that, well, the first contract was offered today. Let's say it would close, uh, same so we have a 30-day closing on it her current contract is going to close on june 27th what i can do is i can submit a backup offer but basically the only problem with this is that you are then stuck like you are under contract so again if it's me that really wants mckenna's house then i can submit a backup offer saying this is my offer they've accepted it as a backup offer but i'm still stuck if it does not terminate on or before June 27th, the backup contract terminates and earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. So what happens in this situation is I'm stuck until June 27th or until their contract terminates, basically under this backup contract. If I really like the house, it's my forever home, but then in two weeks I find another house I really like, I can't put an offer on that one because even though I'm not like under contract, we don't have a accepted contract going through right now, I'm still technically under contract with her property because I put in a backup offer. So, and what happens with the backup offer is as soon as the current one terminates, that just automatically goes into effect. So they've already accepted it, it just automatically goes into effect. So I don't really get a say in that once that happens. So if on June 12th, I find a house I really like, I can't put in an offer because if on June 20th, this contract terminates, I am in now under contract to buy two houses because I was under contract to buy this one before due to a backup offer and I, I submitted another offer on a different contract or different house. Yes. To get around that one, can we all can could it be terminated? So say they want to buy the other house. Yes. Would they would they be able to terminate it without uh being penalized or this is like a contract that just cannot be terminated. So basically you're going to be stuck in it. You can't really, there's not an easy way to back out of it. Okay. Um, could you, this is an interesting question. Could you back out during the auction period of this one mm -hmm. to go and to stay with the other one? Mm -hmm. So if you put a 10 day auction period, you could back out of the auction. You could, you you know. could back out of that, but you still have to go through the process of paying the auction money. You still have to pay the earnest money and then get it back by stuff like that. You can't just, so. Um, and what would happen too is like if I signed this contract with uh, McKenna today and we put the effective date as, let's say we said it was, we, we signed it tomorrow, we signed it on the 28th, I would put in that box the effective date is the 28th of April, but whenever this contract terminates, let's say it's on the 15th, the new effective date of that contract would be the 15th. So if I had a 10 day auction, I'd have to the 25th of June. You would get, everything would then start on that day that I was notified that the previous contract would terminate. That way, I get my three days to submit everything. I get my 
whatever, however many days of option field, like seven or five, whatever, I get it from that point, not from April 28th, so it's not like I'm already out of option and I can't do anything. So you kind of get stuck. That way you get you get all your time to do your due diligence without having to worry about it. But that was a good question. Um, another key thing about backup contracts is that if you are required to submit all listing or all offers to your client if you're the sales agent. Um, your client can, however, request that you do not off, you do not show them backup offers, but they have to do so in writing um, just to let you know that, hey, I don't have to show them. That way you don't get stuck in a situation where you had five backup offers. They were all way better than the offer they're in, but you didn't show them to them. And now he comes back on you for well, you didn't do your job in showing the offers. Well, you did. You told me I didn't have to. You want it in writing just to make sure. So they can request that um, that you don't show the backup offers. They can request that you don't show them a certain type of offer. So while it might seem like you have to show them every single offer that comes in, that is true unless they notify. If you have a notice that says, or if they've given you things that say, "Hey, we put our house up for three hundred thousand dollars. Don't show us anything that comes under two sixty then you don't have to show them if you get an offer for 250. But if they don't give you a notice, you have to show them an offer for 100,000, even though it's close to 300, because you have to show them every offer. Um, but if they notify you otherwise, I know that's, that a lot of times they'll say like, if it's under 10% of what our asking price is, don't bother, stuff like that. Then in that case, you don't have to show them those if they if they notify you of that. And the same with the backup things. So. In writing, could it just be like a text message? I believe so. Is that right, Dustin? Say that again. For like, if a seller notified me, the seller's agent, that I don't want to show them, like, don't don't show me anything under fifty thousand under what I listed it for. Does that have to be in writing? Like, it needs to be in writing, but well, like an email or something like that, or is you still need to say, even if they tell you, because you never know how some of these contracts can be wrote. So I have clients that tell me, no, I don't want anything under 200. Okay, I understand that. But I'm still going to send them to you because I have a legal obligation to. Now, if they put it in an email or have it in writing, that's fine. But it's just best practices just to say, I understand, but I still have a duty that I need to send them to. You. Yeah. Because you don't, just my luck. <laughs> if you told me that, don't send me anything under 200. I would get something from Travis from 19999 and then in that situation is I don't send it to you and he's got great terms in his his yeah. deal and so in five days and, yeah. <laughs> and so then okay. I don't show it and then you get mad. So I just learn, just send them off, just be done with it and, and what you have. Even if it were to annoy them. I mean what you can do is just get them all together and just send it to them once a week. If you get a ton of them. Put them all together. But doesn't that have to? Doesn't that fall under um, to send it to them as quick as possible? Like a reasonable time. Yeah. It, well, I mean, it's, you have to agree. I always tell my clients all the time, I'm not going to send you those every single minute. Okay. Like if I get 15 of them at one time, I don't have time to be sitting here just okay, send, 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 send. I tell them that I normally send all my offers at one time every day, and I'll forward them all to you at that time. And are you okay with that? Now, if they want them instantly, then in that situation, I have to work something out. They request it. But it's not in the morning. I mean, you said any time. Yeah. I, me personally, I tell them around five o'clock, I try to do it too, just so that the date counts. Yeah. Um, but and you'll see a lot of like houses for sale that they'll, especially now it's such it's a hard market where instead of you sending an offer and they'll tell their client, they'll just basically have an agreement with their client where like, Offers end Friday at 5 p.m. Yep. And so at, on Friday at 5 p.m., they'll just sit down with their client and show them all the offers that have come through throughout the week. Um, you get that especially now. Again, such a hot market that you're getting offers in left and right that it's it's hard to keep track of what you've sent and what you haven't sent. So it's easier just to go, you know, if you put a house up, um, let's say you put a house up on Thursday, you can just say by the next Friday, I'll, you know, offers will end that day. I'll send them on to my client and we can go through together and figure out what we want to do. Um, you want to put the deadline on people who aren't sure if you want to come see the house, you better do it before Friday. Um, but also it helps you and your client not to deal with like 
wait, do you have that one from that one guy that's, I thought it said this, and you're like looking back through old emails and everything. It's like, you can just save them all together and then just send them all over at one time. So, it's actually easier on both of you. Uh, yes, and right here, an amendment for our modification of the first contract will not terminate the contract. So if you have an amendment date, that will extend the closing date. That does not terminate it, but it, it does not extend this date and this, because this is a different contract. This is not the first contract. This is this would be a newer contract or the backup contract. So um, if they were supposed to close on June 27th and they ended up signing an amendment, they'll close July 1st. That doesn't change this. If they have a close by June 27th, you can still you're still out and you can, you're, you're no longer in your backup contract. You can move on to the like, but, um, like, but that does not, that is not necessarily terminating the first contract where now you're under contract. So, um, I know I've seen things where you're like, well, I put in an offer on the 29th of April. We're supposed to close the 29th of June. If this falls through, well, then it doesn't fall through, but they extend it out to the 3rd of July and people will go, well, shouldn't I be the one in it now? Because I was supposed to close before them. So technically now I'm under, like, like no, because their contract was never terminated. They just extended the closing. So. All right. That's tricky. Yeah, That's <laughs> it, can, it can be really tricky. Um, and another thing with backup offers, now that I think about it too, is you can only accept one, because again, they go under effect once the first contract is terminated. You cannot have five backup offers lined up we're like well if, if one terminates then we go to two and then if that terminates we go to three because if you do that by the time you get to five it's been a year and a half <laughs> for all the all the 30 or 45 day options so it's like it's just going to be annoying so they they make it where you can only accept one backup offer um and then again as a buyer you can put in a backup offer but you can't put anything else in because you were technically under contract if that one falls through so Just have you had anybody, because it's not like you can't, it's just you, sh you shouldn't or else you're stuck to buy two houses. Yeah. Have you had anybody while under backup try to put in an offer in another place? Oh, yeah. But have you, had any, have you ever had to like go through, like they will refuse you not, like where you've had to submit the offer? Or I have had people that are like, let's see what happens and then if I get, if it falls through or whatever, I'll just sue or whatever. You know, you get people that are like that. Yeah. They'll try to do two, three, four, five offers yeah. just to see. Uh, but again, it's our duty to inform them. Now, if McKenna is my client and she's that she doesn't listen, but I tell her everything, uh -huh. right. I've done my job. I've, I've told her. Yeah. She still wants to do it. I still have a duty to do it. Yeah. That would okay. be a lot of earnest money lost. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, Me personally, I never do a backup contract ever. Yeah. Unless it's an investor that. If he gets a grade, if not, no big deal. Yeah. yeah. Because if it's somebody's like I'm house, not from a, yeah. If it's somebody's I'm house, we don't want to get them stuck for three months trying to wait to buy a house if yeah. they're trying to move tomorrow. Yeah. But if it's just yeah, if it's just some investor that's like oh, I just want to buy it to rent it out. If it works cool, if it doesn't, yeah. I'm not losing anything. I just didn't get it. I'll move on to another one. Someone yeah. in that case, it's like, do you deal with a lot of investors? Oh yeah. I prefer investors any day. Yeah, they're way easier. They're more yeah. Google. Yes. And, and they know their stuff. And it's not yes. Yeah, one thing I have noticed about backups is you'll see a lot more in hot markets because supply is so low that a house will go on the market they really like and then it's gone the next day. Yeah. Well, they want to put in a backup offer because you never know what's going to happen. Whereas if it's like, if supply is really high and there's a bunch of houses mm -hmm. around, there's no point in putting the backup offer because we can go look at 12 more tomorrow. Exactly. But if you're looking for a, you know, a three bed, two bath, this exact square footage, this acreage, this whatever, there's probably only two of them that are going to be for sale in town. If you looked at both, you hate one and you like the other one, you might as well put a backup offer in because if something falls through, you like it. But if if it doesn't work out, well, nothing else is on the market you want. So you're going to have to wait around anyway until something comes up. Um, I'm dealing with a lot of clients right now that I've dealt with for months because they just they want something i go show them one and then like nothing happens for two three weeks where I just nothing's on the market that that's like the, like that fits their description yeah and so i keep sending them stuff and they're like no i need it to be here and i want it to be this big and i want that and i'm like i know i'm just 
I'm sending you what I can find. And then, and then another one comes up to go look at it, but then it falls through or something. And... Have you ever thought about like going door to door in those specific neighborhoods and just ask people that live there? That is a thing we do. Not, I am I am not a personally, but that is a thing a lot of real estate people do. Is um, I know we're actually I'm kind of helping us go through right now, but we have a bunch of terminated listings that are expired listings that are basically somebody put their house on the market last year, it sat up on the market for six months, and then it just kind of expired because that's how long they're putting on the market for. Well, we might as well go by and see if they're still interested in selling their house. And see, you can get this much for it. The market, the market's a little bit hotter now, so it's actually worth this now, or whatever. Um, and I have seen people that would just walk around, like Pebble Creek, or you know, some sort of a little bit higher in the area, and just walk around and either go door to door, pass out flyers, or whatever. Of like, hey, I did a CMA, and I found out that the houses in this area sell for average seven hundred dollars, like you know, something ridiculous, like whatever they can find. And it's like you, you can get a lot of money if you sell your house, and that will people might want to move because of that. So. That is a thing people do sometimes. I haven't done it personally because, well, it's it's also it just seems like a lot of. You might get like to be fair, you might get one house in the whole. I mean, if you get one house in all of Pebble Creek and you walk around for two weeks, that's still a really good paycheck for for the two weeks of walking around. But it just you have to weigh if that's something you want to do because you might also walk around for four months and not get anything. So it's like but you, that's future advertisement. Maybe they yes. know somebody. Yeah. And that, that that is one thing we do a lot of we try to in any situation. I mean I was I really heard Aiden on the phone yesterday. Somebody asked about a property and he starts talking about it and they go, actually I don't think that's what I want. He goes, Oh what 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 do you want? And then they're like, Oh, I was looking for something more like this and he's like, Oh, let me do a search for you. And then suddenly he went from probably selling a property to now he's helping somebody buy a different property. Like he's now a buyer's agent for them for something else as opposed yeah. to a seller's agent for them coming through and trying to buy a property he's selling. So um we try to keep everything open. That's I know what he said about if you get somebody that looks, they want to put up, you know, half an acre with a two bedroom house on it for two million dollars. Cool, I'm gonna put my sign out front and let people call it because people they don't know what the house is worth. They'll just call in. Hey, I saw a sign. How much is it worth? I'm like two million. And they're like, wow. And they're like, I know it's ridiculous. Anyway, what are you looking for? I can help you. <laughs> it's like, I tell them, like you can always transition the conversation into yeah. into helping them buy a different property. So. Yeah. All right, and now we're going to go over the reservation of oil, gas, and other minerals. Uh, this addendum deals with fundamental issues of ownership of oil, gas, other minerals, and, and the waiver of surface rights, and warns all parties to seek legal counsel before signing the contract. Um, with this, this only goes for oil, gas, and minerals that are basically under the surface. You are not going to see water, you're not going to see sand, gravel, you know, asphalt, none of that stuff. That's not mineral rights, that's just stuff on the surface. Sand is just even the sand that under sand is just it's sand. It's not part of minerals, which would be more of uh, stuff you'd mine for oil and gas, stuff like that. <coughs> so yeah, I'll pull this one up too. Hey. I think it's somebody. Oh. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, All right. Um, so here we go. The agenda for reservation of oil, gas, and other minerals. Again, you will not see this in condos ever because they do not own the land, so they cannot retain mineral rights because they don't own the land the minerals are in. Um, just a key for you. So basically, this will, you'll see this only if there is land that can be conveyed. Um, what this is for is that if the seller wants to reserve mineral rights, then they would basically have this addendum attached. I just actually did a transaction where the seller of the property we were buying wanted to reserve mineral rights. They wanted to reserve 75% of the mineral rights in the property. Um, you do not see this a lot, but you will see it every once in a while. Like I said, I just dealt with this. Um, we closed on it like a week and a half ago or something like that. So like, you will see this every once in a while. Um, however, this is one of the few situations that I will if I, if I have a seller that wants to keep mineral rights, I will advise them to go get an attorney or go talk to a lawyer. Um, just because if I fill out this form wrong, it, everything can be like, if you own, and you'll actually only see this on properties that usually have like 100 acres. Um, and that's because they probably have some sort of drilling or something on there that they want to retain. If you put this form in wrong and they lose that, 
that's a big no-no. That's a lot of money lost for them. That's a lot of stuff that comes back on you. So this is a situation that I will always advise them to go seek legal counsel. Um, not somebody I would like advise, but they need to go find their own attorney or lawyer or whatever and seek them out. Um, but basically, if you fill this wrong, if you fill this out wrong, you can lose rights for them, which is never, never good. Um, so then the new buyer would automatically, it would just default as a 100%. Yeah. So basically, if they wanted to, if the seller wants to keep all mineral rights, they would just check box one. If they only wanted to keep some, they put here, and like I said, put um, undivided 75% interest here. Um, now, the reason that this is a situation where you do want to uh, have them seek counsel is that you do not know how it's split up. I've seen properties that Again, if it's probably over 100 acres, I bet it's not somebody, who, it's not just one dude who bought it. It's either a company or it's a, a family that's been passed down and kind of split through generations. Well, then suddenly it's not just your, it's not just Tom that owns it. It's actually Tom, his four brothers, his two sisters, his mom, his kid, whatever. Like it's split between this whole family. Um, but so because of that, if you just put in here a random number, you don't know what you're actually getting rid of if that's other people's things or whatever and like there's a problem where you could come up with um basically if you go through this well suddenly it's not just your client that has to sign the paperwork it's also his whole family yeah. everybody that has an interest in it and it becomes a much bigger problem yeah. um so this is a situation again i advise them to go talk to an attorney that way they can kind of fill everything out they can find out who owns the rights in the first place, how much he's allowed to get rid of, all that sort of stuff. Um, that makes a lot sense. Yeah, so that's, this can just be a big hassle, which is why this is a situation that I will like encourage somebody to go find legal counsel just because you never know what the situation they're in is. Um, and just because you're talking to some guy who's, you know, it's a client you've known for a while, a super nice guy, wouldn't do anything to backstab you. Well, he might not be trying to, but it just could be a legal situation where you didn't realize that now it's a whole big thing and you thought it was just this guy trying to, I'll keep some of it. And then suddenly you're in a big legal battle because it's not just him, it's his whole family or it's a company he owns that owns part of the land that you're getting rid of. So now they're coming after you and blah, blah, blah. So it's just a situation that it's best just have them to talk to somebody. Yeah. Um, and here, if the seller does or does not reserve, um, basically rights to go on the property um, of ingress and egress and of reasonable use to providing, drilling, exploring, operating, developing, stuff like that. Um, I've seen it where like somebody will, they want to keep 50% of it, but then they don't want, they don't ask for access onto the property. And so it's like, well, now you have mineral rights, but you don't have surface rights. So you can't put a drill there to drill whatever you were going to, whether oil or whatever. You don't have surface rights to put anything on the property to get any of the minerals. So basically all they've done is if the now owner wants to do something, they get some of the profits of it, but they don't get the right to go out and drill because it's not their land. They might own some of the minerals under the land, like underground, but they don't have surface rights, so they can't go out there and put a bunch of stuff, a bunch of equipment up to, to drill for that stuff. Yeah, that's so, where the easement will come into play, so they can actually like, yes. have something to go through there. Yeah, and so that's that's what this would be here is basically your you're retaining implied rights of ingress and egress and a reasonable use to go out and do that sort of stuff. Um, what is ingress and egress? That's basically the right to go, it's basically the right to go on and off the property, um, to go out, put stuff on it, and um, I guess like mine drill, explore, stuff like that. So you're getting rights to take stuff on and off the property. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. So, uh, mineral rights would that pertain to say somebody has an orchard and they want to keep a percentage of the profits? Of what that would doing? not. That would be. That's when it gets tricky on if that's actually property or personal property. Because like we were talking about the whole way, it's a watermelon. Can you take it off and all that sort of stuff? Um, that would not be minerals, because minerals, again, would only go for stuff, mainly stuff underground as far as natural natural minerals, so oil, gas, stuff like that. Um, if there's like a, a, a vein of iron or whatever, like stuff like that, but you wouldn't really get as far as like 
cross, that would be something different. Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. Because I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure how you would go about that. Yeah. If that would be like a non-realty items, because it might be realty because it's technically on the property and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm not really sure how that would work, but um technically cool rolling through the mineral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's weird. I know it wouldn't be that foreign exactly, but I'm not exactly sure how you would go about that. What's the question? So she was asking for the mineral rights, uh -huh. what you would do in a situation if you wanted to keep 50% of the profits from the orchard that the vines were growing out of. <coughs> I'm assuming that wouldn't be the mineral rights. You'll, you'll do the addendum, but you need to have the current draft. So it'd be like a separate, it'd be mm -hmm. almost a different addendum that should be coming out. Okay. Completely separate. That's what I figured. Okay. Yep. I was like, I, I can't really think of a form that is promulgated that would yep. cover that. So I'm assuming it'd just be the one we have is very basic summary. But the one that you're talking about, if it's detailed, you have to have an attorney draft it. Yeah, that's good. That's happening that in that situation. Does that good? All right, so notice the buyer's termination of contract. Um, this provides the buyer to provides for the buyer to notify the seller that the contract is terminated pursuant to the following. Uh, buyer's unrestricted right to terminate the contract under the termination option provided in paragraph 5, not 23, it's now 5, of the truck promulgated contract form. Um, the buyer can obtain buyer approval in accordance with the third party financing addendum. And I'll go through this in a little bit. Um, if the property does not satisfy the property approval in accordance with third party financing, a uh, buyer elects to terminate under paragraph A of the addendum for property subject to mandatory membership in an owner's association, or the buyer elects to terminate under paragraph 72 pertaining to the seller's association notice. Okay, let me pull up that form because this is. I'm sure. There we go. Okay. Notice the buyer's termination. So, this is a form again you fill out. If you were ever going to terminate a contract, you will have to fill this form out and send it over. So, um, in this situation, Let's say I am still under contract to buy McKenna's property. And we go through the process and I decide after whatever that I want to back out of the contract. This is, I would have to fill this form out and send it over to explain why I'm terminating the contract. So um, this unrestricted right to buyer to terminate contract under paragraph five, that is the option period. So if you were in option, you would click check box one we have a 10 day option period, it's day seven. I've done the, I've done the um, inspection. There's some stuff I didn't like that I saw. So I'm just gonna back out that you would just click this box here. That is, that's probably what you click the most if you use, when you use this form. Um, there's some other ones that you'll see quite a bit, but for the most part, you'll click box one just because you'll go look at a house, do an inspection. Some will come back wrong, or maybe just after they look at it, they just realize that's not quite what they want. They kind of think about it a little bit deeper and go, now that it's a little more real that I'm gonna move into this house in 30 days, I've realized that I don't really like it that much or whatever. Um, so you'll click box one. Um, the buyer cannot obtain buyer approval in accordance with a third party financing addendum. That is basically if the financing falls through. So if something happens where they, um, they get financing and everything's going good and they lose their job and financing backs out or whatever, this is the box you would check for basically financing falls through. Financing falls through that you put box two. Um, however, this is, if it falls through with no fault of their own. So if this is not, if the buyer approval, the, they cannot obtain buyer approval in accordance with third party financing to them at the fault of the loan or the, um, the financing, not so much what they've done. If, if in this situation, since I'm the one purchasing a house from McKenna, if I go out and buy a new Bugatti because I love cars, and then because of that purchase, I can no longer qualify for my loan. That's on me. So I cannot, That this does not apply because that's fault of me, not fault of, at, at, at no fault of the buyers, basically what this, this box is for. Um, the property does not satisfy property approval in accordance with a third party finance addendum. So this would be if you, decide to go under contract at a house, you obtain approval, um, or at least you get, you go through the financing, they've said you're approved to get this much money, all that sort of stuff. 
Well, then they go out and inspect the property, and the basically lender, when they do their inspection, would find out that, or when you would do an inspection, if the lender gets it inside, oh, there's like WDI, which are wood destroying insects, um, there's termites all throughout the house. They will no longer, they'll basically say, I'm not going to give you the money for that house. Um, and they can basically refuse giving you the loan because it's a bad investment because the house has wood destroying insects or something like that in it. Um, so the reasons for the lender's determination. So if the lender determines that the house is not worth it and they decide to back out from giving the person the loan, that's when uh, Box 3 will come to it. For the buyer elects to determine, terminate under paragraph A of the addendum for property subject to mandatory membership in the property owners association. We'll go through that addendum in a second. But basically, paragraph A, you would, as a seller, inform the buyer of what all you have to pay for. So if we go under contract and then suddenly I realize, oh man, there's I own 300, I own or I owe three thousand dollars a month in my HOA fees. I'm not doing that then this is the box where basically once you get that, you have a certain amount of time to back out based on what comes back in that form. The buyer wants to terminate under paragraph 7B2 of the contract relating to the seller's disclosure. So this is that um, the seven days after you receive the notice from the seller, or after you receive the seller's disclosure, you have that seven days to back out. That's what that box is for. If you get the seller's disclosure and you find that the roof hasn't been replaced in 30 years, they, the AC unit hasn't been replaced in 30 years, this hasn't been replaced, then you might just not want to take it on because you know, even if it passes inspection, there's a lot of work coming up because I have to replace a bunch of stuff. Um, you have those seven days after you've received the notice to back out of the contract. That's what the box five is for. Uh, the buyer likes to terminate under paragraph three of the addendum concerning right to terminate due to lender's appraisal. Um, this would be if I go under contract at $300,000 and then an appraisal comes back and says the property's only worth two seventy-five. dollars The lender will refuse to give me the loan because the appraisal did not match up to how much I want for the property. He's, I'm asking for too much. The property's not worth what I'm asking for, it's worth less. So basically the lender will refuse to give me the loan at that much. Um, so that's what box is for. Buyer elects to terminate under paragraph 6D of the contract, uh, 6D for residential condominium contract, because the timely objections were not cured by the end of the cure period. I want to say 6D, that, yeah, 6D is the objections. So how we put in our residential or rental use or whatever. If you put in there that residential or rental use, and then it comes back that, oh no, this can only be used for um, agricultural purposes, or this can only be used for blank. And that's not one of the things you put in there, then you have objected to that and you can back out within that time frame. That's what box seven is for. Eight is for other. You will not use this a whole lot because there's not much else that you can rightfully back out of a contract for that's not already listed. Um, if you're not doing one of these first seven things, you most likely cannot just send this over and be like, we're out of here and just call it a day. So um, eight, you won't see a lot. I know one, one way you will see eight, I'll oh, actually pull this up too, um, is for mutual termination. So sometimes the buyer and seller agree that they both want to terminate the contract and agree on how the earnest fund will be distributed. Um, most title companies have forms available for mutual termination and termination of the obligations under the contract are one issue. A release of earnest money is a separate issue. So even if you both agree that you want to terminate the contract, the buyer and the seller mutually agree that they want to back out um, that might release the obligations of the contract, but that does not release earnest money. There is a release of earnest money form that will have to be sent um, to one party or the other, and they will have to decide how the earnest money will be spent or how it will be um, distributed. Let me see if I can find that. Oh, I guess that's, and so they don't really have one for this. What I was going to say is, what you might see a lot, and I what Justin says, is if you were going to mutually terminate, the best thing to do is in these contracts, there's a notice of buyer's termination and a notice of seller's termination, because both parties can terminate from the contract. So the best thing to do would be, if you notice on the buyer's termination, for example, it says the buyer and, and you put in the seller's name, and then at the bottom, the buyer signed, there's no spot for the sellers to sign. Because again, this is not a two-way thing, it's just you terminating your, it's terminating the contract. You, the other party doesn't have to agree to it, you just terminate it. 
the best thing to do if you're mutually terminating is actually put eight and put uh, both parties have mutually agreed to terminate the contract. You would just write that in. The buyer would send it to the seller and the seller would fill out the seller's termination and send it to the buyer saying the same thing. And then basically that's kind of a way to cover both ends where both parties have received a notice that they've mutually terminated. Um, that way you both have a record that it was a mutual termination. You can't come back after that. And we won't go through the, the release of earnest money form because that's more of a thing for um, the title company. But basically all you put in there is um, like the buyer releases the earnest money to the seller or the seller releases it to the buyer. You can put in there how much if you wanted to, how this says like they will agree upon it. Um, how the earnest money will be distributed. They can just decide that each party gets half of it and you can send that to the title company and the title company will split that up and send it away. Usually if it's a mutual termination, it goes to the buyers because they're the ones who put all the money up. So if you're mutually agreeing to terminate, it usually just goes back to the buyers because then everybody's back to playing, you know, ground level and everybody can work, you know, to move on with their life. Um, but I have seen this where if you try to mutually terminate and the other people agree to terminate, but they won't have the earnest money, you might have to deal with that. With that part. All right, so you did it for property located seaward of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. This is a fun one that unless you live in Galveston or on um, in any of the beaches down there or South Padre or whatever, you won't use um, ever. So. I know Justin said that he's been a broker for over a decade now and he's never used this form because he's never dealt with a house that's literally on the beach. Um, this is only for, for, for properties that are on the beach. My parents live in Galveston and I'm working on selling their house now. I don't need this form because they're literally a block away from the beach. So they're not on the beach. What this form does is it provides notice according to the natural resource code that if the property is in a close proximity to a beach fronting, of the Gulf of Mexico, then the public has the easement to or over the area of any public beach and state law prohibits any obstruction of the public easement and that structures erected on or over the easement are subjected to a lawsuit to remove them. So with this basically, I'm not going to pull this form up because you won't really use it, but basically all this is doing is if I put up a obstruction that covers the entrance onto the beach, I can't do that because the beach is public property. So even if I live on the beach, I can't like block off the beach and be like, I don't want people out here because it's mine. You can't do that. You have to allow people the easement to get onto the property um, or onto the beach. You can fence off your property. You don't have to necessarily um, let people walk through your front and backyard onto the beach, but you can't block the beach itself or you can't use obstructions to basically block. If you live on the beach, you can't put fences up that go down to the water. And like this square of the beach is mine. The beach is public property. You can put a fence at the end of your yard, but then the beach past that is public property. But can you plant trees though? That would be still an obstruction. They won't. They don't really grow that well. In this. I was going <laughs> to say that. It's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the addendum for coastal area property. Um, provides notice according to the natural resource code that the owner of the property may gain or lose portions of the tract because of changes in the boundary of state owned tidally influenced submerged lands and state law prohibits the use encumbrance construction or placing of any structure in on or over state owned submerged lands. Now what this is basically saying is that it, it's kind of the same thing where you can't put anything on it to obstruct it, but also you basically have to agree that since the state owns the tidally influenced lands as the tides go in and out those are those are technically state property but if erosion occurs and it starts wearing away at your backyard your property gets smaller and smaller and smaller if the tides go further out your property gets larger and larger and larger it's basically saying that there are state-owned tidally influenced lands and that you can't again you can't block off part of the beach and say it's yours because that is a state owned property. This also, the addendum for coastal waterway, um, it warns it, it warns people that Texas has the right to um, take their property as well. So basically it gives, the, it gives the state of Texas the right to move your property back because the tides are moving in or, or not, like, not like the tides are moving in, but overall 
you know, your property's eroding away. So the key phrase would just be, this allows Texas to take part of your property. So I believe so. But that's kind of like the, it's one of those things that like, it's only used on the coast and it's kind of just, you have to give this notice as like a warning of like, you can do it, but just know that Texas could come in and be like, this part's mine. Like, that's kind of just what you're doing. So. The addendum for property subject to mandatory membership and an owner's association. Again, this is what I was talking about earlier with the, um, uh, the box that was checked for like, if on paragraph A, it'll tell you how much you have to pay basically. We'll pull this up too. It's kind of No, same. All right, so basically you put in the street name and then the name of the owner's association. Um, so you put a one, two, one, two, three main street and then here you put in uh, fancy homes, HOA company or whatever the name is and then also the phone number. Um, so you put the name and the phone number in there, address above, and then here, the subject, subject of the information, basically, I think it's normal practice you put one so basically saying within um, eh, usually 10, within 10 days after the effective date of the contract, seller shall obtain, pay for, and deliver the subdivision information to the buyer. Um, and then within three days of receiving the, the notice, the buyer can back out the contract. So um, the reason that one is like normal terms, the box that's checked is because that basically says the seller will obtain and pay for it. Two says the buyer will obtain and pay for it. However, the seller is the one that lives there, so they probably know the most about the area, about how much they pay, and about they probably are in contact with the people at the HOA because they pay them every month or whatever. Um, so it's just normal practice that it's usually it's usually one. And I believe oh they changed this. I didn't hear about this. Okay, so um, oh there okay yeah so in C. Basically, a lot of HOAs will they will charge for you changing ownership of a property. So it's usually a hundred dollars. But basically, what this is saying is that the buyer will pay a hundred bucks to transfer ownership from that person to them. So now they are in charge of paying the fees and everything. Most HOAs will just have like a, it's usually a hundred dollars, but it's just it's another fee they like to throw in there. Of just we're well, gonna start off paying us a hundred dollars because you're changing all the stuff on us. So annoying, but that's. That's something your family loves. Hmm. And again, um, mostly, as far as like this stuff, everything is negotiable. Um, don't just think that because it's common practice that it's one and that it's 10 days that you can't put two and put 20. So you can put whatever you want, everything is negotiable. Just Keep that in mind when you're going forward because you'll see a lot of stuff that'll say like who is responsible for paying for this and a lot of times it's no one or whoever it's uh, it's usually whoever's negotiating the contract whoever they find out is negotiating the contract but um just remember that everything is negotiable and you can change basically any blank or check box you can kind of move around or change depending that's when you do your negotiations back and forth So you're talking about the time of closing contracts to have stuff written all over them. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, I know I mentioned that last time and I, I haven't got with this in the form back and forth yet, but I was gonna have him me and him send a contract back and forth so you can see what it'll look like when it's all initial and check boxed and everything. It's it's insane. <laughs> so it's like, wow. Yeah. Uh, also Anytime a subject property, not a condominium, and subject to mandatory or membership in an owner's association. Condos are never going to be part of an owner's association. You might have condominium fees or dues because you own common areas and you have to, you know, you pay for the lobby and you kind of help pay to restore your tennis courts or whatever you have on, on your in your condominium. But that is not a owner's association. That is not part of a homeowner's association. Um, even on the form, now that I think about it. Even since they're here, not for use for condominiums. So just keep that in mind too. Short sale addendum. These 
are annoying. Um, um, actually, now that I think about it, one more thing I totally forgot about on this. Um, it is the titles company, the title company's job to act on behalf of the parties. So even though it says the seller shall buy, like obtain all that stuff to get the subdivision information, they basically have to request the title company give it to them, and it's the title company that has to act on their behalf to to, to get that information. Um, title companies kind of have a better idea of how to search for and find information of certain properties. I did a transaction the other day where they asked if it was an HOA, and I said no because they never paid their HOA. Like, there's no homes there, it's just land, you know? And then we go through and they do a search and find out that the subdivision actually, if technically in, does have an HOA fee. We've been excluded from it because of the, like, because of the positioning of our place or whatever, but technically there is an HOA if we had a house, but it's just land, so we haven't had to pay it, all this sort of stuff. But we would never would have found that out because you can't just like look it up. You can't just type in the subdivision name and it's like stuff pops up online where you can just find everything. But Title was able to do a search and find all that stuff out for us. So that is a really interesting situation that like, that's a situation you might not come across, but um, what is they saying is whoever's gonna buy it, obtain it, they basically are paying for it, but they're paying the title company to do that search and to find all that stuff. All right, short sales, now we can move on. Um, so short sales are, if I buy a house for $300,000, Let's say I bought it two years ago. The market kind of goes down. That house is only worth 250 now. I also lost my job. I can't pay my mortgage anymore, so I want to sell the property. Well, I can only sell it for 250 because that's what it's worth. But I owe more than that in my mortgage. So if you're a lender, this is or a bank, this is kind of a big no-no because you owe three hundred thousand dollars, or let's say I owe two ninety something at that point or whatever. You owe two ninety. You can't sell the house for 250 you owe us more than that in your mortgage so you're not going to cover yourself by just selling the home um you can do a short sale it's just a matter of getting everybody to agree to it which is a very tricky situation um so basically this addendum provides a contingency for the seller who is selling the property uh, at a price that is below the current mortgage balance it provides a contingency for seller to obtain the lien holder's consent for, and a provision for the refund of the earnest money in the event the lien holder's consent is not obtained. Um, these are very tricky, um, but basically they're really, really hard to do because banks want their money, lenders want their money. So it's hard to get a bank to agree to waive all $50,000 in fees or in, in mortgage um, because they want to get out of it. There are so a lot of realtors will basically run away from short sales because they're scary and you have to deal with a lot of headaches. But there are people who are like short sale experts. Um, you can have realtors who like specialize in short sales. They are usually very, very, very experienced. You wouldn't do this right off the bat because again, it's a lot of headaches and it's a lot of stuff you have to deal with. Um, I have seen where people will basically a short sale specialist agent will charge an upfront fee. So let's say they charge $500. They'll charge $500 and then um, they'll charge 500 to basically tell the seller, I can get the bank to agree to let you sell the house. If you pay me $500 now, I'll work on it. And then if you sell the house, I'll wait, like that fee will be included in my commission. Um, but what you're doing is basically getting $500. If it doesn't work out, you still make your $500. If it does work out, you actually make the full commission of the property. So there are people who will do this. Um, and those people are usually very, very knowledgeable because they will pull like the seller, the bank and the lender, whoever into the, into a huddle and get everybody to agree to these terms. Now, these are again, very, very, very tricky. And you don't see these a lot, um, but you can convince a bank, like for example, well, he just lost his job, so you're not going to get the 290 out of him. But if we sell it for 260, you can get your 260 tomorrow, or you can, you know, in 30 days when we sell it. But if you if you keep asking for 290, he doesn't have that. You're never going to get it. You're going to just keep adding these fees, and he's never going to pay them. And eventually, he's just going to 
it's going to go to collections. He's not going to pay it, all that sort of stuff. Um, but if you accept the 260, you're making 30,000 less. Yes, but it's either that or you'll sell it to, for 240 to somebody in a year when he never has paid the mortgage. They're going to sell it to a collections company anyway. You're basically just offering to get the less amount, but not to worry about selling it to another company. So it's very tricky. It's very hard to do, but if you're super charismatic and you are really good at convincing people of stuff, um, you're very persuasive. I've seen you can do this. Um, I think Justin said the shortest short sale he's ever dealt with was six months. And the longest one he's ever dealt with is two and a half years. So these take forever. Um, they're not quick, but, uh, so they're not short. They're not short. No, <laughs> they're, okay, they are not short. Um, I'll actually pull the form up too. So, you can... oh. so it would be more beneficial for them to do the short sale than to foreclose on them. Yes. You're basically trying to convince the bank of that. Um, and depending on how much you can get, if it's a, if it's a three hundred thousand dollar house, you owe three hundred thousand dollars on your mortgage, and you're gonna do two ninety. You can some you can usually convince them that that's okay because it's either that or they're they can't pay it, so it's not gonna don't think gonna pay it ever. Um, and they'll sell it for two fifty to a collections company, or they can accept the two ninety now. You can like a lot of times they'll take that, but I have seen some where it's three hundred and they want to sell their house for two forty, and it's like that's probably not gonna work because they'd rather sell it to a collection for two fifty, and then. They already made their money, so there's no point for them. So, um, let me pull it up. All right, so basically. This is the short sale agenda, and in D, you're going to put um, when you think the short sale will be completed. Now, if we were doing this now, it is April 27th, I would put something in here like <coughs> August 30th or September, whatever, because again, they take forever. Um, you always want to at least put two to three months or three months out. You will probably have to move that eventually because, like we said, it takes six months to two years. But you want to put in something that's again not extreme, but you want to shoot for far out because we know it's not going to get done in a month. So um, this will usually say like just to, just because it's going to take forever. Um, now a thing about this is when you're in negotiations, they can't be evicted because the bank is in negotiations and negotiating a short sale, so they can't evict them for not paying the mortgage. Weird situation, but basically, like Justin said, the longest one he had was two and a half years. So basically, even if the person does not pay their mortgage and they go into a short sale negotiation, it takes two years. They can't be evicted for those two years, which is, which is ridiculous because it's really good for the seller because they might as well just keep the negotiations forever because they can never get evicted. Um, however, in two years, a lot can change. And even in six months, a lot can change. And Justin has heard stories of Somebody goes into a short sale um, with a client. They talk to the client. Basically, what happens too is it's the seller's job to talk to the lender to work out the short sale stuff. But if the seller is not paying their mortgage, they're not going to want to call their lender up to talk about that stuff. So it usually falls on the buyer's agent to try to work this all out. Um, so usually, the buyer's agent will have to call the lender and kind of negotiate and stuff like that. Um, Justin has heard stories of, let's say, you go under con or we start negotiation talks now. We'll take six months. We don't get, you know, into the end of negotiations until October. October comes around. We finally hear from the lender that we get to go ahead. So you call up the client and be like, hey, good news. We're going, we're under contract now. Like, we're, we're going to sell the house and everything. He's like, oh, actually, I got a new job and I'm making like four times as much as I used to. I forgot to call you. So I don't, I'm not going to sell it anymore. Like we're good. I'm, I caught up on the mortgage. We're all good now. Wait, what? Like, and so because a lot can change in six months. So he has heard stories of stuff like that happening. And again, that's why you charge $500 a month is to <laughs> you get something out of the deal. Even if it was six months of negotiating for 500 bucks, you got something, I guess. So um, you won't, 
you won't deal with these. I know I'm somebody who just won't, I don't want to do these. These just seem complicated and look too much work. It's a lot of, because again, as an agent, you're not just calling the seller and having them deal with stuff. You're usually the one having to call the bank or the lender or whatever and negotiate. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, but again, there are people who literally will just do short sales because they they know how to work this, not, not work the system, but they know how to how to make the money doing it. They know how to persuade people and stuff like that, but this works for them. They already have the connections to the yeah. bank. Yeah. And yeah, again, if you're a short sale expert, you probably have a connection to every bank in town. You can probably talk to any lender and they know who you are. Yeah. You, know, you kind of try to work it out that way. So. All right. All right, so more on short sales. The seller is required to make every reasonable effort to obtain the lien holder's consent. Again, it's the seller's job to talk to the lender and get their go ahead. But usually they will try to avoid that as much as possible. So if you actually want to do a short sale, it usually ends up falling on the agent to do that. Um, however, option money is still paid and time is of the essence. Time is of the essence means you do it as fast as you can. That still might take two and a half years because sometimes that's just how long it takes to negotiate. So time is of the essence because again, you're trying to sell a property and this is one of those forms that is there, but it that doesn't mean it's going to be quick. It's still going to take forever. So who are they trying to sell to? Just like a buyer? Just like, yes. So somebody will actually just get in contract or go into contract with somebody and wait like two years to buy that property? Sometimes, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And sometimes, and a lot of times you just go into negotiations and negotiating <laughs> what you'd be allowed to sell for. So if you've got a bunch of offers at 250 and then you go to do your short sale and then you go into negotiations with your lender trying to get them to accept it, by the time you come out, there might be nobody still willing to buy your house, but you know if you sell it for 250, you're good. Yeah. They've already agreed to those terms. So if by, if you you go, we're good, and then three days later you get an offer at 250, you can just accept it because you know that the bank has technically agreed to those terms. So, that is a lot of times what the negotiations are about. All right, resale certificates. There are two promulgated resale certificates. That is very key. The subdivision information, including resale certificate for property subject to mandatory membership in a property owners association. That's not cool. And the condominium resale certificate. Those are the only two resale certificates that are promulgated by TREC. Um, these will be filled out by a representative of the HOA, and they are used when property is subject to mandatory membership in HOA, and the buyer wants more information about the membership or subdivision information. Um, I will also pull these up. I want to say these are in. So here you go. So this. Fun fact, will be filled out, prepared by the property owners association. This form is not filled out by the buyer or the seller or the agents. This, prop, this form is filled out by the homeowners association, by a member of the committee or the president of the owners association, whatever. Basically what this form is, is if I'm buying a house and I want more information on the homeowners association, I would request this form, the HOA member, whoever it would be, would fill it out and send it to me. Um, but this will tell you if the property is um, subject to a right of first refusal or other restraint constrained in the restrictions, uh, the current regular assessment of the property. So let's say you pay a certain amount per month or per year or per uh, a biannually, whatever. Um, special assessment of the property due after this resale certificate is delivered is blank. Uh, payable as follows for the purpose of the total amount of all amounts due and unpaid to the association that are attributable to the property is blank. That is a very key blank there because what might happen is you might end up as a buyer, go to buy a property. Turns out the seller has not paid their association fees for three years and they owe $10,000 to the homeowners association or whatever. So they will have to cover that at closing. Basically, if you go through this process at closing, if the seller was supposed to get 300, they would get 290 of the 10,000 or the owners association. Granted, they wouldn't get 300, they would get whatever minus commission, minus fees, and whatever. But 10,000 would go, how much they owe would go to the property owners association. This also helps too. Um, I have seen MLS things that say 
uh, HOA fees of $100 a year. And I'm like, I bet you mean $100 a month. You can use. It's a drop down menu, hit year a month. I bet you click the wrong one. So there are stuff that is incorrect sometimes, just not people trying to be mean, but just typing stuff in wrong. Put $10 a month, and you're like, I don't feel like that's right. <laughs> Something like that. So um, this is the thing you can, you can request that will basically give you more information. I know Justin said he had a client once that it was $250 a year, and they thought, sweet, let's do it. They got this form back and it said it was actually because they had like a pool, tennis courts, all sorts of stuff at the, at the homeowners association. Turns out that it was two fifty a month, and that was to not get any access to any of the facility. It was five hundred a month if you wanted to get access to the pool, and it was another hundred dollars a month if you wanted access to the tennis courts, stuff like that. So this is a form that you can have that will that will clarify all that stuff, so you don't move in going, well, this two fifty a month. We talk, that's what that guy pays. That's it. Right? Understands that a two fifty a month. But then you get there and realize that you don't get access to anything because you only pay two fifty a month. You can actually get this form filled out that will help. Basically, the homeowners association itself fills it out, so they will let you know what you're going to pay and how much is due on it. So it's good to request for that. Yeah, if the property's in a homeowners association, it's almost you just want to request it just yeah. to make sure. Because um, again, even if it's two fifty and you know it's two fifty and there's no other fees, you don't know if they pay everything. <laughs> um, Another key thing is that a homeowners association can force the sale of your house if you have not paid, if you're like unpaid on your dues. If you go to a certain point, the homeowners association can actually force you to sell your home because you're not paying them. Um, so what will happen a lot is you'll get somebody who realizes that the homeowners association is about to force the close of their house, so they want to sell it first, so they go and sell it. But then what happens is you get this form back and it says they owe ten thousand dollars because they never paid and that's why the homeowners association wants to sell the house and you go oh well now you have this form well basically the title would catch it anyway but basically you they are they don't get scot free away from it you now have proof that they owe this much money to the homeowners association so they'll get their money back at closing so that's what that is you want this form if you if they're in a homeowners association Course this form, it just makes everything a little easier. So if they do owe ten thousand dollars, what do you do with the agent? Like do how do you like them? I mean it'll come out at closing. So basically okay. when, when they get your closing disclosure, it'll have uh, I know we pulled one up the other class, but it basically has who pays what, how much this cost and this cost and this cost. It'll just have a, a credit of uh, or five hundred or ten thousand dollars or how much it was to the seller basically coming out of their account going into the home. home. As a buyer, you don't have to worry about it because again, if you're on three hundred thousand dollars, if you're paying three hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars for a house, you're still going to be paying three hundred thousand dollars. As a seller, as a seller's agent, not a huge deal because house is still selling for three hundred thousand dollars. It's just the your seller is not getting all the money they thought they were going to get. But as a seller, it gets you get you basically get caught and you can't you get less money than what you thought you were going to get. But at closing, it all sorts itself out where. Your buyer, it's not like you go to buyer's agent, you can't worry about your buyer moving in and there's other things they have to worry about. It all gets covered for them. All right, non contract forms. So this is going to be um, uh, oh, I guess another thing with those HOA things is basically what the HOA does is they'll put a lien on your home for $10,000. So that's why title would catch it is that if you remember title does a, a search to make sure there's no liens and stuff in the house. It's not so much saying that HOA will just, they want their $10,000. They actually can put a, a lien on your house, same as a mortgage. They can put a lien on your home for a certain amount of money. So that's how title will catch it and they can pay that, pay that amount. Um, anyway, so here it is. Consumer information form. You will hear this referred to a lot as the CPN or the consumer protection notice. Um, I actually never heard it called the consumer information form. I've only heard it called the consumer protection notice. Um, but this is a, uh, a form that brokers and inspectors are required to display this form in their office and consumers are advised about the availability of a recovery fund and how to contract track if they have a complaint. Basically this form will let people know um, it gives your clients and just anybody a way Consumer protection. So this lets your clients and everybody know how to contact Trek if you have if they have a complaint against you. Um, right here, you can send a complaint against a license holder to Trek, 
and then here is Trek's website. And oh, oh, um, oh I clicked on it. Right there. Yeah, and so this is where they're located. You can send them an email, or you can send them a, a letter, or you can call them, or whatever. This is something that you have to give every single time to every client. Um, it's good practice to honestly give them to them every time you talk to them. I know a lot of realtors you deal with will have this as an attachment at the bottom of their email in their signature line. So it's sent every time they send an email, this form is sent with them. It just helps cover them. Um, you don't want to get caught by track not sending this form out. If I go talk to a client, I will always bring this form with me and have them sign it. Um, if you were dealing with a client online, you can use something like zip forms or DocuSign or anything like that to send them this form and have them initial on it. Um, what we usually do on like DocuSign is I'll send this form over and like right here, I'll just put a little initial box or down here, I'll put a little initial box so they have to initial that they've received it. That way they can't say, because if I just send an email with this in it, they can just delete it and not ever open it. And they were technically never notified. I sent them an email, but they didn't look at it. They can argue that like I didn't do enough or whatever, even though I did send them an email, you, it's just best to make them do something, whether it's initial or whatever. Um, also, right here, Trek administers two recovery funds, which are used to satisfy a civil court judgment against a broker, a sales agent, real estate, real estate inspector, or easement or right away agent. Uh, certain requirements are met. What this is saying to, right here is that sales agents, such as me, Aiden, anybody in this office besides for Justin or anybody in this class that's going to be getting our license, you're becoming a sales agent. You are not seen. Okay, they're out to get you. Um, what they're basically is saying is that it's not just a brokerage. You would think as you sign a broker, like a, a uh, independent contracting agreement, you feel like you might be getting protection by the broker, that if something happens, the broker's there to protect you. It comes back on the brokerage, not on you. This is saying that it will come back on you. Um, a lot of suits that come through will say, if somebody was suing me, for example, they would say, like, we are basically suing um, Nobles Realty Group, Justin Nobles, Travis Stahl, and any and all other parties that are involved in this transaction. Basically, suing all of us, if we had a real estate inspector, a real estate inspector come in, they might be involved, all that sort of stuff. It gets very complicated. However, don't let that scare you. Um, I know a lot of people start going through this part and they go, well, this sounds like a job where I just get sued a bunch. That's not really how it works. This course is to protect you against the like maybe 0.1% of a-holes in the world that like will, are out to, to get you. For the most part, people are nice. I've dealt with so many transactions where stuff has gone wrong that I've covered my butt, they've covered their butt, but like stuff has gone wrong where they like, you know, there are so many ways we could go after each other and we all just kind of call it a day and, shake hands and go, go our separate ways. Most people are like that. Most people are not going to try to get everything from you. I have a client that, man, she's a lot, but every time I talk to her, she just wants to sue somebody, and it scares me every single time, because that'll come back on me. You know, she's sued somebody, it can come back on me. But uh, one of the people, like, if they say the wrong thing, she's like, let's get them. And I'm like, calm down. Please, <laughs> please calm down. <laughs> so um, there are people like that in the world, but you can get sued for driving. You can get sued for walking on the street and bumping into somebody. They can sue. I mean, you can get sued for anything. So, just because you're in a job where you can get sued, you can. I, I used to work in a bowling alley. I could have got sued there for bumping into somebody the wrong way or dropping something. It, it happens. So this is just it just there to protect you. Again, this is a notice of how they can complain against you. Um, now you might think, well, let's just not send this out because then they won't know. If you really upset somebody, they will just look up like tre Texas real estate government, whatever, like commission or whatever, and they'll find Trek. They'll find the website. They'll find Trek. They'll complain against them anyway. And then Trek will come back and realize you, they'll investigate. And when they investigate, they investigate. When they investigate, it's not just they look through a couple of emails. When they investigate, they'll like, they'll go through every file this office has. If they're investigating me, they'll go through everything everybody in this office has to make sure. They are very, very, very thorough. They will find that I have not sent this form out. I will get a ding against that as well. So if they were complaining about A, I got A against me, and I got B because I didn't send this form out. So now I have two things against me. So it's just, again, a lot of people just attach this as a signature in their email because it's just good to send it every time. I know Justin sends it every time he talks to anybody, this, this form he has. Um, 
Just saying, just make sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of people will do it just to just to cover their, their self. Yeah. Like I have a real estate email, so it, like my real estate email, I have this attached because again, I'd only be dealing with real estate stuff in that situation. Um, but like my personal email, I don't have it because I don't need it. But I don't deal with work stuff in my personal email. So <laughs> make sure that's all because this is a very important form. Um, Okay, yeah, that's everything else. So the next one we're going to talk about too is the information about brokerage services. This will be called the IABS. Um, now the IABS is a voluntary, it's voluntary in form, but it's mandatory in content, basically saying all the stuff in it you have to give, but it doesn't have to be in this exact document. Um, I know we've had an agent before that likes to put a bunch of like, she printed this out but the ones she printed out, they were like had a different font. They were all bubbly. They had flowers on it. They were whatever. You're allowed, like, it's not so much the exact form has to be mandatory, but the content in it is mandatory. It must be provided at the first substantive discussion in relation to a specific property. Now that is key and it gets kind of confusing because what that basically means is that if I go show somebody a bunch of houses, I don't have to give them this because I'm just showing you a bunch of houses. Um, there's no substantive discussion about any property. We're just kind of going out. If you then call me later or while we're out of property, you want to start talking about, well, do you think they take this off or do you think they do this? How much, what is that? And you start asking a bunch of questions about the property. I'm then required to send you this form. Um, what I have is I have a little, like I have my dad's old my work suitcase and I have a couple like a binder in it that just has a bunch of CPNs and a bunch of information about broker services. Just in case I am in the car and I suddenly get a call and I need to go to a showing. I've had I've been driving before, got a obsidy lead that turned into a real lead, and then I that person wanted to go look at the house in 20 minutes. I called the agent, she said no problem, so we drove over there. All this happened while I was just on the road and never got I didn't go to the house. I was just you know between on the road and going to this property. So again? the consumer protection laws. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so in that case, if she wants to go out and start asking a bunch of questions, I need those forms of me so I can give them to her. Now you don't have to have them immediately. Now you can, for example, if you get caught out like I was and you you know, you have to go to a property now because it's a million dollar house and they want to buy it or whatever, you can go out. And but you just have to tell them, you have to basically mention the form. You have to basically tell them, hey, I need you to fill out an information about record services. I'll send you that form later. I'll, I don't have it with me, but I'll give you an email. I'll send it to you when, you, when, we, when I get back to the office or whatever. And basically what this form has is it has basically the types of real estate license holders. So it'll explain what a broker is, a sales agent, the duties a broker is required to do, and then a license holder, it'll have what you're supposed to do as an agent for a buyer, as an agent for a seller, as an agent for both if you're an intermediary, a sub-agent, how to avoid disputes, contact information, and then here you would fill out this this section here with all of your information. So um, I put in here. Oh, uh, let's just sure. So I guess that'd be office email and office time. But basically, you do that. I put in. Uh, his phone, and then let's say so. In this situation, I'm gonna I'm gonna put me in here because I actually just I just started my own team. But um, so in this situation, I have a team that is under me. I'll just put that in it's my Apple one. Oh, is that a real uh, group under you? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um it's just me right now, but uh -huh. we got it all licensed and everything, so it's a real thing. But basically if I have a team name or a team and let's say McKenna's a part of it, then I would put in her information here. Sure. Um her email, her phone, whatever. But this form I have to be filled out, and this is what you would give to your client. 
basically it would tell them what the company or what the brokerage is, who is the broker, who is your team lead. So this is a form of Kendall would get on our clients. Um, for me, I would just put my name here and leave this blank because I'm not a part of the team. Now, basically, what this is saying is that I am a supervisor of a sales agent. You do not have to be a broker to be a supervisor. I know one thing we've talked about in this office before is, you know, when we had 10 agents, we didn't need it. Like, it can just be Justin and then all of us. That's fine. But when you get to, like, 50, it's hard for Justin to keep track of all 50 of them. It's easier to have five team leads, have them take care of 10 people, those five answer to Justin makes the hierarchy, or I guess those five would answer to Linda, everybody answer to Linda. And then that makes the hierarchy a lot easier. Um, so if you have a team, like, I, you know, I just started mine, this would be where you put your team leader's information and then your information on the platform. And then you would send this out to your buyer, tenant, seller, landlord, whoever, and have them initial and date this form as well. Now this date is as good for as long as usually for as long as your like agreement, whether it's your buyer representation or your listing agreement or whatever, it's as good for as long as that agreement's good. Um, this, like I have a client who will, like he just keeps, he's an investor, he kind of buys and sells random stuff. Um, I have, like, I think I have like a two year agreement with him because he's a good family friend of ours. I know he's not gonna go anywhere else. So we have like a two year thing. So as long as this date matches what's on there, it's good for as long as that agreement's good. Um, but this is something you would want to fill it out every time, just to, again, to cover yourself. Um, a good, so a problem with a lot of these, uh, these notices, the CPN and the um, consumer protection notice, or the CPN and the IBS, is that, like I said, Trek likes to investigate, and they're very, very, very thorough when they investigate. What you will come across in this situation is you will have moments of, you will get a call in the office and somebody will say, hey, I heard you're selling a property at 123 Main Street. You can say, yes. How much is it sold for? This this is the price. Oh, how many beds and baths does it have? This and this. That's all fine. When you start getting into, well, cool, do you know anybody I can go see it? I have this many questions about finance. Like when they start getting in-depth questions, that's a substantive discussion. You then have to send them this form. So at that point, you can say, cool, I can answer those questions. Let me send you a form real quick. I just had to initial it. We're going to go. Same with the CPN. You have to send them that at the same time. Um, if they refuse to sign either one of these, which is like people don't because people understand it's your job. Um, I've dealt with a lot of clients who I'm like, I have stuff I need you to just, it's kind of weird on your first meeting to be like, can you sign these forms? But a lot of people are like, yeah, because like they understand like it's not me who wants them, it's trip. Like it's not, it's not me trying to get your initials on everything. It's the commission I work for that's like trying to make sure we're all in line and compliance. Um, but basically you would send in this form and you would also send the CPN over. The CPN does not have a spot to initial. So again, if I send it through DocuSign or whatever, I would just attach a little initial box to make like just so there's somewhere to sign on it. Um, if you're doing it in person, it's a little more tricky because I know one thing, one thing that Justin always told us to do was basically take this out, have them initial it, and then you take it back and keep it for your records. Problem is then they don't have it. That's one thing I've, I've never understood is if I take a CPN out, somebody initials it, I go cool, and then I take it all back to the office. They don't have the record. Do they not just scan it on their phone or something? Yeah, so what, what I usually, what, you have to get their initial in the way. So what I usually do is I give the form to them, have them sign it, and I just take a picture of it or scan it on my phone. That way I have documentation, but they have the actual form. I actually have, do you have two forms? We've, I've done it before, but it just gets to the point where like, then you're, can you sign this one and then also sign the same thing again so I can take it? But it's just, yeah. it gets a little confusing. Um, Sometimes it's just easier just to, uh, just to, like I said, I usually will just go here, can you sign this? And then when they sign, they go, cool, take a picture of it, move on. And people don't, I don't know, it's fine. Um, but a lot of times you'll send this over through email or something, so you can always just attach a DocuSign or a whatever sort of uh, initial box for it. Um, what I've done for many clients is that you might not have a substantial discussion until they go to put in a contract or something like that. I've had clients that I've been out of the showing, I didn't have the forms to me, and then suddenly I've done 12 showings to this person, so I'm just out there doing another show and another deal. And then they start getting really serious about something, and I'm like, oh, I don't have the form. Can I send that to you later when I get home? 
And as long as you remember to do that, you're usually okay. You just, you can't just say you're going to do it and not do it. Um, you have like the, the PDF saved to your phone where is that like standard right in front of you they can like sign it on the phone? That's one thing Justin does is he usually has a he hasn't saved in the phone usually so if somebody asks so asking that he can just email it to him. Because you don't have to have them initial in an email because then you both have the email saying you sent the you know whatever. Um so a lot of times you'll just send the email over it they might not be able to initial it but again they at least have the form so you 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 can send up another one later where they can initial it. And then if Trek wants to say anything, you can be like, well, I sent it to him at 2 p.m. and I sent it to him at 5 p.m. and had him initial at 5. I just want to make sure I got it to him. So. And as long as they respond to the email, then that's, that's proof that they, that's proof that they saw it. Yeah. Um, now, one thing that's really tricky about these is that we have had, like I said, when Trek investigates, they investigate hard. And so Trek has so many investigators, they will just call the office randomly and say, hey, can I talk to Travis? I heard he has a property at 123 Main Street. I start talking to him, they start asking a bunch of questions. And if I just answer them all and move on with my day, I've like violated sending this form to them. And since it was a Trek investigator that called me, they know I didn't do it. So again, that's why, that's again, why Justin just sends his, the CPM in every email, is just to make sure that if, it, if it's a Trek investigator that emails you, they're gonna get it, because it's attached to my email every single time. So um, they can ask the questions and you can be like, certainly, and then just be like, if you have an email, I can send you more information. Yes. Yeah. So I've actually done a lot where like if somebody wants to start talking about stuff, I'll let me go home and when I get to the office, I will fill out um I'll do a CMA on your property or I'll do this or that or I'll I'll do some searches for you or whatever. Or if you like this house a lot, I'll go do a like a um comparable market analysis on this property that you like to make sure it's worth what you want. Like if you're going to pay 254, I'll make sure it's not worth 200. But when I do that, again, I'll attach this, the CP, I'll attach everything to it and send it over. That way I know they have everything. Um, and again, you only need this the one time. If I start talking to a client, because again, I know we talked about this before, but like they are a customer until you get them to sign that representation form. Until they sign the representation form, even if you're a buyer's agent, your duty is to the seller until they've signed that they are your client. So if they tell you certain things, you have to convey that to the seller because your duty is to them. Um, when I have them sign that agreement, I'll just have them sign it. Um, if I have somebody come into the office, they want to go look at some properties or whatever, I'll say, cool, can you sign this buyer's rep? Can you also sign this IADS? Can you sign the CPM? You can have them fill this out before the first substantive discussion. I've done that many, many times. Um, but it's just... I've had clients that like when I get to the first house, I'll be like, hey, I know where it's happening to look today, but I want to let you know that if I can get you to sign a buyer's rep, I can give you more information. We have confidentiality at that point. I can I can keep things confidential between us. I can also give you my opinions as opposed to just um, giving you facts. If somebody asks you about a house, you can read off the MLS sheet what it has. But if they start asking, what do you think about this? Or how much do you think they'd accept for this? you can't answer those questions because they're not your client. Um, so I'll kind of let them know that like, if you can fill this form out, we, you can actually be my client and we can actually have a little bit more in-depth discussions and stuff like that about properties and I can give you my opinions. You get a lot more stuff from me. And when I have them sign that, I'll have them sign this saying, here's some information about brokerages and here's a CPN, can you initial that? And basically it's all covered. So then we're good. Um, it's not hard to get people to like initial this. You don't really have to worry Again, if you just do this as quick as you can, same with the, like with a buyer's representation form, we like to have those signed before we show anybody a property. That way we don't show somebody 10 properties and then we're like, okay, cool, thanks for showing me around for five hours today. I actually have a, my brother's a real estate agent, so I was gonna sign with him, but I'm just, I'm glad you can come on here today. And it's like, well, then why did I waste my whole day? I didn't realize that, okay, cool, like whatever. Um, but if you get them to sign the form, they have to work with you, they can't work with somebody else. So a lot of times we get people to sign stuff before we even go out because it's not worth it to lose that that time, wasting the time to go show somebody before they, without them acknowledging that they're going to use you as an agent. Um, and when they sign that, it's really easy. If you're doing it through zip forms or whatever, attach all this stuff together, send it all over as one big form. They can just initial. So. If they decline to sign it. If they decline to sign it, but want you to show them. Yeah, you can define. I've actually done showing that I've gone out to a house before. We looked um, we looked at one house 
And then I think two weeks later, they had me go out and show them three more. I hadn't had them sign a buyer's rep because I just didn't think about it in time. Like I just, I, it was like my first, it was one of the first clients I ever had. So I was going to think about it at the moment. <clears throat> we get out to the, those three houses on the third house. I noticed their budget was higher than what it used to be. Their budget was like 150 and they were looking at 250. And I was like, did y'all get like an increase in your budget? We ever worked that way? That's, kind of, that's nice. Like, were y'all able to do that? And they're like, oh yeah, we actually, we were using this lender we, we used to know, but now we, we moved over to like Rocket Mortgage or whatever it was. We started using them and they actually provide us with our own, they increase our budget and they actually give us our own realtor. Like if we work with them, we actually can get more. And I'm like, cool. Well, if y'all want to go, I'm going to go ahead and lock up. And they're like, what? Like, we had just got to the house. Like, I had opened the door for them. And I was like, all right, if you want to step outside, I'll go and lock the door for you. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, if you already have it, I'm, there's no reason for me to be here. And I'm like, well, I thought you helped show us the property. And I'm like, I don't get paid for any. Like, at that point, I'm, I'm telling them, like, I don't get paid for any of this until you, unless you sign with me, unless you sign to buy a property with me, I get commission off that. Other than that, I'm driving to Brenham twice for no reason and spending two days out here for nothing. So, People, a lot of people just don't know, um, but you are able, like, like I said, we literally got to that third house. We had a fourth one we were going to look at, and I just said, cool, if y'all want to walk out on the lockup and head home, like, my day's over, so. Yeah. And they're like, well, we still have that other one. Like, well, then you can call your realtor friend that you, like, that you just got off rocket order or whatever and have them go show you, because yeah. they're going to be your agent. They're the ones who should be doing this anyway, so yeah. it's just, it can get weird, but, <laughs> but yeah, if they, if they refuse, you can refuse. A lot of times, I know with, like, forms like this, if they refuse a buyer's rep, that's shady. Like if they refuse a buyer's rep, I don't want to work with them because I don't know what. They clearly have something. They're just like they're clearly working with somebody else or something. If they refuse this, a lot of people are just like, I ain't signing nothing. You can't give me an initial on nothing. Um, you can just have them write on the back that I refuse in their own handwriting. That way, if it comes back that like they never got this form, you can be like, well, I have this that says I refuse on the form that I showed them. It's in their handwriting. Um, that's the only way to do it. I know. One thing that's really tricky is if you can't get them to sign, good luck getting them to write anything on anything. You can always but send it to them certified through the mail. You can. That is something you can do is send it to them. Yeah, certified through the mail or any other way. To, if you if you send them an email and they respond saying I ain't signing nothing, they have the email. <laughs> it's like yeah. they, they have it. They re they respond to it, so they receive yeah. it. Um, but yeah, it's it can get kind of tricky. But for the, I've never had a problem with any of these forms because again, most people are. They're chill. They know what you're doing. They're going to sign the forms because they know you have to. So. All right. And then the last few things today. So we have the non-realty items addendum. Now, remember, this is the addendum we were going to use um, when non-real estate items are being transferred from the seller to the buyer, and the buyer pays for the item in addition to the sales price. This assures the lender that the sales price is only for real, is for real estate only. Uh, property is transferred without warranty. Now, let me pull this one. So many tabs up here. Yeah, I was like, uh, <laughs> there's so many. So a, an addendum or an amendment will be attached to the contract. So okay. an amendment changes the contract, an addendum is attached to that contract. A notice would be something that's not attached to a specific contract. It's just something like an, an IABS, you wouldn't attach that to your contract, but that's something you have to give your buyer or your client to let them know stuff. But if I attach, if I give that to the, the client, they sign it, but then they never buy a house. That's that's okay, but they've been notified of the thing of the CPN and all that stuff. Got it. Same thing. It's just it's not specifically attached to one transaction. It's, okay. it's attached to a person. All right. Yeah. So here, uh, one, two, three, nine, street, sure. So uh, here you can put like for an additional. Let's, let's go fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, the snake refrigerator that's in the the the. the I'll put spec fridge in kitchen. 
on the go. Blue. Oh, it's a blue stack bridge. Okay. Um, so here is the form of basically if there's anything that is not real property that you also want, this is where you would attach it. Again, you have to put a sum. I was thinking in my head, I, was, I forgot that you have to put a sum. I was thinking you put zero and that just be included. Um, but you do have to put something in to show the lender that the sales price is for the house, not for anything else. If you put zero and then put a bunch of stuff in here, what you're telling the lender is that that $300,000 you're paying for the house is not for the house. You're paying two ninety for the house and 10000 for all the stuff in the house. But you could put $1? You could put $1. All right. Yeah. You just have to put something here to prove that you're, that's what the sale price is for is for the house itself. Because um, again, if a credit looks come back and it says something different, or if the lender finds something in the house that would, you know, they don't want to give you a loan for a fridge, they're giving you a loan for a house. Um, like and this a, is also like a boat or an RV or something along those Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot of things say, like we also want, um, we want the house, and then. In this, can you also leave the RV, the lawnmower, this, and the tractor outside? And it's like, that's a lot of stuff. But that's not, if you just put zero up there, you're basically telling the lender that you're paying $50,000 for the RV. Like, you know, you're paying a lot of money for everything else and not much for the house. So um, you can put $1, but it has to be somewhat reasonable. So you might not be able to put one. Again, if you're buying a tractor, an RV, this and that, whatever, you can't put $1. It has to be something, you can put five grand. It might be worth more than five grand, but you're at least showing that like it's you're you're putting more money out there. You're not just putting a dollar out there. So this has to be like somewhat reasonable. Oh, it's not real. Um so this is also we use this form basically in every transaction to have nothing else put this in there. Any and all the personal property left at closing funding. Um, or left at subject property, close, whatever. But basically, we put that in every single one because, again, you don't want to get caught in that situation where you buy a house, you go to move in, you can't because all the seller's stuff is still there because they're not going to move out for another three weeks. Well, now you can tell them to get off your lawn. That's not your stuff. You can have a big garage sale or you can just keep it, whatever you want to do. So um, that just saves your clients. Again, doesn't do anything to the other party. If they follow, if they do everything correctly, but if they want to be those guys who will stay there afterwards or whatever, they need to either sign a lease or um, if they sign a residential <laughs> lease, you can change this and change it to at the end of termination of the lease agreement or whatever. Um, but they're not allowed to just stay there afterwards. All right, and then yeah, buyer and seller sign. All right. Real estate consumer notice regarding hazards and deficiencies. So this notifies consumers of hazards that improperly installed water heaters, faulty temperature and pressure relief valves, improperly installed or lack of ground fault surface protection. Um, this decision is correct, or to correct the hazard is left up to the parties. So if there is a hazard here, again, that is up to the parties to decide who's gonna fix it or what, what you're gonna do about that. Um, I want to say that's the one thing we use. So basically, it's just going to be a form that has. If this is mis malfunctioning installed properly or missing ground fault connection, blah, blah, blah. Um, if there's any of this stuff, it's basically letting you know that this could be a thing. You have to be aware of it. If stuff is deficient, you'll have to work out who's going to fix it. But it's just a notice that TREC requires you send to just let them know that if something's wrong, you at least warn them of that stuff. So, so are all the notices required to send? Not all of them. Um, they should be okay. in. So what we're doing to make it easier for us in the office is we actually have a um, 
in zip forms, we're doing templates that'll have basically a representation template, or if you hit, like, you're doing a buyer, you're doing a buyer for a one to four family, you'll click on buyer one to four family for the template, and it'll pop up two folders, representation and contracts. And representation, there'll be a required and a voluntary. Required would be all the notices that are required by law, so the CP and the IBS, the buyer's representation agreement, all that sort of stuff. And the voluntary, you would have stuff like the, um, I think what we voluntary notice. So nothing on this. Nothing on this. Yeah, no, no, nothing on this. All this stuff would be required. All right. um, but in contracts, you have stuff like the, a voluntary thing would be like the lead face paint addendum. Like it is required if it's if it's that, but it's not required in every transaction because it's only required if it's prior to 1978. So there's, you have the two folders. So it's easy because you can just go into required or to representation, hit required, and just e-sign everything over at the same time, put an initial box in every single form, send it all over, and we know we're covering it. So um, it makes it super easy on us because we don't worry about like, did I send that? Did I send them this? If, if it was in that folder, I just sent that folder to them. So they have everything. This <laughs> makes it a lot easier on them. Identify for property in a propane gas system service area. Notice to the buyer of a property in a propane gas service area. Check with the distri distributor to determine the cost that they will be required to pay and the length of time that will be required to provide propane gas to the property. A copy of the notice that the, distri that the distribution system retailer was required to record and the real property record must be attached to the addendum. Now, this is a thing, if you are in a gas system service area, all this is is a notice to the buyer that they are in a gas service area and if they have to pay to be in that area, how much is going to be. It's not a complicated form. Uh, I'm not going to pull it up, it's not much, but very easy, very um, simple form. You probably won't deal with this a whole lot, but this is something that will email us. It will say if it's in a gas service area, so you kind of know ahead of time. This is something also that's not required. Addendums are not required at the very beginning of a transaction, so you don't just send this over when you put in an offer. But if you go through eight days or whatever, and then Hydro comes back and goes, by the way, you're in this area, you will attach this one to it and move on from there. It's pretty simple. Somebody's going to find out about it and let you know, and then you can attach it to that point. <laughs> but um, it's something that you won't see a lot this far, especially. But, like, even while we're doing all the processing and doing getting all the forms and everything ready, y'all will still be there to coach us and make sure that we're doing everything right, even though, like, that you've been here, for example, five years. Yeah. You'll still have it just coaching you on what. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have a truck, and that's what, that's like Linda's sole job here, is to make sure we have everything we need that truck requires. Um, she helps. If I get a thing from somebody, I send it to her and she puts it in our forwards and zip forms and makes sure everything's in there so that we're all covered. Um, we have checklists that like, if I go through and I mean, cause I get a disbursement forms that basically, it allows me to get my check of my commission or else Justin gets all of it. In order for me to receive that disbursement form from the brokerage, I have to have that checklist filled. So basically she makes it where like, if I have put no on like, did I send them an IADS? I have to send them one before I get that disbursement form. Um, because even though Trek didn't catch it before, again, statute of limitations is four years. If they come in in three years and start going through, because when they go through, they're not just going to go through that track, they'll go through everything on the computer. If they go through all those little contracts and realize I never sent them an IBS to anybody, that's a bunch of fines against me, even for stuff that was two years ago. So that gets very hairy. So we have it where everything is in a checklist and we get all that stuff ahead of time so we know what's coming up and what we're going to be going through. Um, that also makes it where we don't miss anything. Um, there is voluntary stuff that if we put no for lead-based paint, let's say, <clears throat> and Linda goes, why did you not fill this out? I can say, house was built in 1985. It's not required. Cool. And we just move on. And as long as we have a discussion on why the no's are no's and make sure all the yeses are, I, I have done, then Justin will sign out that disbursement form allowing me to do that. That's how we cover it. If you don't pull that stuff out, you ain't getting your money. So, Smart. good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, it's something you just like they just started doing recently, and I'm so in favor of it because my first transaction, I probably didn't send half this stuff because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And it was during a time that Justin was busy with playing a bunch of other stuff, so it's like he wasn't at the office a whole lot. I'm trying to deal with it. 
I started a week after Linda, so I'm asking Linda, and she's like, I have no idea. And so we're just like both confused. Um, eventually, we got it all sorted. Justin came through and sat with us for a while and sorted everything out before the transaction ended. But having something like that is super nice to go through everything. And again, if you're in the office, we're all here. It's really easy for me to turn to Stephen or Aiden and be like, hey, does this look right? And we're all here. We're a team, so we're all working. So, yeah. Cool. So one thing before we log off, I was going to say, um, so this is chapter seven. We only have nine chapters, so we have tomorrow and Thursday, and that is it for all the chapters, all the lectures and everything. On a Friday, if you go to chapter nine's materials, there are some hypotheticals. They're not scenarios, those are different, but there are hypotheticals, and it's just a, basically a picture of a, the textbook that has some hypotheticals on if this person's selling a house to this person for this much money, and you are this person who works at this firm, whatever, fill out a contract and go, like, if you were that situation. If you all want to do scenario one, or at least hypothetical, at least hypothetical one on there, uh, I'd advise you do more. If you do all of them, send them to me. I will go through them, make sure you did it right. If not, I'll let you know what happened. But if you at least want to do one, that is what the first hour of the class on Friday is going to be, is going through hypothetical number one and talking about what we got right and got her. I'm going to fill it out on here, and we'll go through everything and make sure y'all did good. Um, the second half of that is going to be, I'm going to do, I'm going to try, if we have time, I'm going to try to do the study session. So I know Stefan did a study session on like Tuesday before the test, and like before class or whatever. I'm going to try to do it on Friday because everybody's going to be here. So I find it's just to do it Friday during class for that second hour. Um, Justin has approved that, said it's good because it is played into the class. So it counts as part of my 20 hours of material for the course or whatever. Um, but so that is my plan is to do that. I know we are trying to get the video from yesterday's class put up now. Um, we haven't received it yet, but we're trying to get that all worked out so we can put it up on the YouTube channel and on, um, on, the course materials and everything like that to cover yesterday was about the other six contract forms uh, or the other five besides the one before. So check that. I will let y'all know if we do that up tonight or tomorrow, I'll let y'all know during class to go watch that. Again, it is required. Now with that, it's literally, I mean, if there's six contracts, we only did one, those are the other five. So it's a lot of, a lot of your course is that one class. So um, watch that. If y'all have any questions, y'all can ask me during class tomorrow. Um, and we will try to clear everything up. If nothing else, you can ask me on Friday during the study session. We'll try to clear everything up then. Um, other than that, y'all have a good night, and I will see you all tomorrow. All right, I'm gonna just log into my Google Drive. <laughs>